I'm excited that we're in here. Uh, I will say teaching Sunday school out there is more challenging. Um, I, uh, you don't, uh, you don't get any comments. You don't get any correction. <laughs> you, don't get, um, you don't get any head wags, right? Yeah, um, and so uh, I do much prefer in here. Uh, I've said it many times before, if all you ever get out of this is what I have to say, then you're not going to get very much. Um, so, again, I'm very excited. Um, I will add, we have others that could uh, do a far, far better job of this. And uh, especially, Revelation is, uh, in my mind, a very challenging study. Um, however, uh, it is the revealing of Jesus Christ. It was given to us for us to know, to study. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little scared of it, but we shouldn't be. We need to study it, and uh, the more we study it and compare it with other scripture, the better we'll understand what was intended to be given to us. As the devotional reading this morning was read, you know, it, it really pointed out that when we talk about the end times, the scriptures are really littered throughout with verses that uh, refer to and teach us much about the end times. It's not just in uh, the book of Revelation, but you really need to study and understand the entire scripture. This morning, as we look, we'll spend some of our time in Matthew chapter 24. And the reason for that is because it really covers a lot of the same territory that Revelation chapter 7 does. And as we look between the two, um, we can compare and see. And, and I say that this morning's lesson is actually um, chapter 7. We missed last Sunday morning, and so I'm going to, in my best effort, try to skim through, if there is such a term, chapter 6, which is the seeds. So, that said, as Dan mentioned, the title lesson is The Saved in the Great Tribulation. Um, this morning's lesson will begin talking about the 144,000. Um, the lesson prior to that is the seven seals. Now we only get six of the seals as we look at chapter six. The seventh seal isn't opened until chapter eight. In between sits chapter seven. I believe that Revelation is chronologic in order. And so as you go through, there are those that espouse to um, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bottles. Um, there was uh, a book uh, written among our people, uh, Bible by Ages. Originally, I think it was Bible in Eight Ages. Um, and it refers to uh, uh, the first seal, first trumpet, and first vial. Uh, but I, I do believe that uh, Revelation, as it lays out, there's no reason to take it uh, as nothing but chronological with an exception. Okay. Uh, I think we've got a section in there that uh, is referring to uh, God's working with man. Um, all right. That said, um, our text is Revelation 7, 1 through 17. I'll just introduce this morning, and then we'll, we'll circle back. The key verse, Romans, uh, Revelation 7, 13 and 14 and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The application the student will learn that even though disasters and troubles um, are through disasters and troubles, people can be saved in the worst of times. Um, with that said, let's, uh, let's go ahead and skip back a little bit and take a, a running start. Uh, when I'm jumping, I, uh, 
I do better if I take a running start, and that may be what, we may be doing a leap of faith here as we go through this. Um, chapter one is the introduction of Revelation. Um, it establishes that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, it is the unveiling uh, of Jesus Christ. Chapters two and chapters three are the letters to the seven churches of Asia. And we looked at those already. Uh, those letters were given to us for our own understanding um, so that we could apply them ourselves uh, both as a church and individually as churches are made up of people. Um, and then we get into chapters 4 and 5. And chapters 4 and 5 is described around the throne of God. And there we're introduced to uh, the angels around the throne and the bees or creatures uh, around the throne. Um, and we're given some descriptions there. Uh, but what we see there is that they are around the throne of God, worshiping God. Uh, we see that they're bowing down. And uh, uh, throughout chapter 4 and then again in chapter 5. Um, the end of chapter 4 in, says in verse 10, the 420 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And that's important for us to know as Christians, as saved individuals, is man was created for that purpose. And in the end, and we're going to see it as we continue to look through, uh, there is much about the worship of God for who he is, and Jesus Christ for what he's done. We also, in chapter 5, are introduced to a sealed book. Verse 1 says, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals? We see, as we go through chapter 5, that they look throughout and they can't find anyone worthy to open the book, able to open the book, and then, uh, and John weeps over it, but then in verse 5 of that same chapter, it says, And one of the elders saith to me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So we're now introduced. Uh, we had already been introduced to Jesus Christ standing on the right hand of God, and now we see that he is the one that's worthy. And the reason he is worthy is because he's the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. He's the one that shed his blood uh, for man. Amen. So, again, chapter 5 continues. We don't have the opening of the seals until chapter 6. But we see there the worship of God in chapter 5. And then we begin in chapter 6. And chapter 6, uh, verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, there's two white horses in the book of Revelation. The other is 19. 19 is very clearly Jesus Christ. He is the righteous one. He is the one that comes to end uh, the uh, uh, sinful, sinful, sinfulness of this world, to bring about judgment. But here we see one, uh, well, let's back up. Verse 1, saw the Lamb, opened one of the seals, and I heard as it was, as it was, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come see. So what he heard was, one of the four beasts saying, come see, it was as if it was with authority. It was very great and very loud. And you'll see this repeated four times here. Um, and then he describes what he saw. I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. Doesn't say anything about arrows, but he has a bow. And it says, and a crown was given to him. Okay? Wasn't, wasn't earned, wasn't deserved, 
earned necessarily, but was given to him, and he went forth for the purpose of conquering and the conqueror. That, that person on the white horse, I believe, is the Antichrist. Uh, he is coming. Uh, he's not conquering by sword or by bow and arrow, but he's conquering through flatteries and deceit. He's drawing in the world, believing him to be the greatest thing, uh, uh, preaching peace, uh, when in fact we know the scripture warns us that when they say peace, peace, beware, for the end time shall come. Uh, now, if you've got Matthew chapter 24 open, somebody read uh, verse 5. Yeah, and that's going to be uh, that's going to be the means by which the Antichrist comes. He'll deceive. He'll proclaim peace. Uh, people will just swell over how great an individual, how great a man uh, this man is, um, and will turn and look to him to save them from all the troubles and trials of life. Uh, we see in verse 3, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And again, if you look at uh, uh, Matthew 24, 6 and 7, and somebody, if you don't mind, go ahead and read that. And ye shall hear of war and rumor of war. Uh, see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes and diverse places. So I probably, I probably should have backed up here in Matthew 24. Uh, I don't want to read the whole chapter, but sort of get the context of when Jesus was speaking this to his disciples, what exactly was he answering for them? Verse 1 says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus saith unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So, his disciples departing from the temple, they showed him the buildings of the temple, and certainly the temple was magnificent. It was very impressive. If it were still standing today, I think we would be very impressed, and we would wonder how in the world uh, people of that time could have built such a thing, uh, and in fact, maybe wondered how even today it could have been built. Uh, but they were, they were very uh, ingenious. Uh, he he tells them uh, that there's going to be a time when there won't be uh, a stone left upon another uh, that will be thrown down. Now, that occurred already. It occurred within that first uh, century. Verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So there's three questions they ask. And Jesus begins to answer those. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You know, we talk about wars and rumors of war, wars as being an end time, but it actually is leading into is prior to. And we certainly are in those leading into days prior to. I think the things that we see today, the reason that we were not in the building uh, is evidence of signs of the times. Pestilence. Yes, pestilence and disease. Uh, and that we are dealing with those things today. Um, he says... Uh, in verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. 
And certainly the Antichrist will do that. Uh, he will set it up uh, to, to receive the worship of people and will receive the worship of people. Um, verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. So let's go back to Revelation. Verse 5, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balance in his hand, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, Say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. See thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to stop there. Uh, so, we have here the third seal being opened, uh, and he says, come and see. And there we have a black horse. Uh, that black horse is symbolic of uh, pestilence, of disease, of death. And you'll find oftentimes that with war, what follows? Disease. Why is that? Why does it happen that way? Yeah, they really in in uh, in warfare, you're destroying. Uh, I mean, that's what war is all about. It is destroying. You're not only trying to feed the armies, but you're trying to eat their sustenance. You know, in the Civil War, uh, I remember it very well. Uh -huh. Or some of my kids might think so. Uh, <laughs> what did Sherman's march do? Was he out there necessarily trying to... Uh, yes, it wasn't about defeating the armies so much. Sure, he had the resistance. And, and there were those battles, but what did he do? He just took a wide swath through the south and destroyed their economy. He made it barren, the land. Uh, they weren't able to feed themselves. They, he destroyed their businesses. It took their, their will away from them. And, and that's what we see here. He that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. What are balances for? Scales. What do you use them for? To weigh things. Why? Buy and sell. Be fair. Yeah, be fair. Unless you've got a tilted scale. <laughs> um, it, it represents commerce. Commerce. Um, and again, we look today, and we have disease, coronavirus. And what has it done to our economy? Destroyed. Far beyond what the disease, and don't get, I am not trying to minimize those that have uh, been ill or sick from it, but they're talking about today that our economy could, before we get through this, if we get through this, be in worse shape than any time since the Great Depression. Amen. Uh, right now, we're dealing with the highest unemployment rate in our going all the way back to the Depression. Um, troubling times. Um, we have plenty of food and toilet paper. <laughs> but you can't get it. Why? Hoarding. Hoarding, which is the same as greed, selfishness. Uh, it's all about me instead of about everybody else. You know, uh, farmers, what were they doing with crops in the field? They couldn't get the crops to the market, and so what were they doing? Destroyed. They were destroying them. They were tilling them over. You don't have to have, you, certainly drought helps destroy crops. But you don't have to have drought to destroy your food distribution. It's the same with livestock. Same with livestock, exactly. And the same thing has happened there, too. What's the problem in, or what has historically been the problem in Somali? It's not been a lack of food. It's been a lack of food getting to the people. It's distribution. So, and I'm not saying that that's all that there is. I think there's the economy, our commerce, our ability to get things to where they need to be is a lot more delicate than what we might have imagined prior to going through
through this recent chain of events. Uh, I, uh, he has a pair of balances in his hand. I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny. What does a penny represent? A day's wage. A measure of wheat is about a quart of wheat, is what I was told. About a quart of wheat. A day's wage. That's pretty pricey. Barley, which typically is used for animals, livestock, we don't normally consume it, is three measures, three quarts for a day's wages. You know, what were the what were the poor eating? They weren't eating wheat. They were eating the barley. They were eating what they could what they, they could afford, what they could get their hands on. And even then, uh, really uh, struggling to provide enough. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Uh, one, uh, one individual talked about uh, the oil and the wine. Uh, they were very precious uh, at the time. They were very expensive. Uh, we have certainly, uh, we talk about uh, America being a land of equality. It really isn't. Uh, now, we have been blessed. And even, for the most part, the poorest of us are rich compared to world standards. But the difference between the everyday working man and the super rich that's out there, they're talking about Bezos, Amazon, uh, within the next 10 years, he'll be the first trillionaire. Now, I think a lot of that market value was taken off, but you're seeing changes and you're seeing money that's directed to a very select few. Right. Uh, will there be those that their money uh, keeps them from suffering from some of these things during that time? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, verse 7, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. Um, let me pause just a second. I don't have my watch on. I didn't bring my phone up here. I have nothing to guide me on time. So I'm going to leave it to you guys to help me out there. Uh, uh, so, uh, pale horse. Um, and him that sat on him was death, and hell followed after him. So death, physical, hell, eternal. Um, uh, power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. So, and, and when we talk about the fourth part of the earth, you'll see to kill with the sword. It's referring to mankind. Now, how many people live in the world today? Yeah, I've heard six or seven billion. A quarter of the earth today is six or seven billion is one and a half, 1.6 billion people. How many have we lost to the coronavirus? Yeah, in the U.S., it's been over 100,000 now that have died from that. Uh, it's... I, I'm, 300,000, I think. A worldwide... That's a small number compared to 1.5, 1.6 billion. And who knows, by the time of this, how many that will be. And if what we're dealing with today has created this kind of uproar in the world, can you imagine what's going to happen going through these things? Power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. To kill with the sword. Now, we already had, uh, in verse 4, uh, that they should kill one another. Uh, what's the difference between these two? Uh, killing one another was just warfare. Yes. I mean, I don't mean to minimize it. I'm saying just warfare. But yeah. it was one army killing another army. Yeah, it was. That's right. And that's something that's changed over the last last half of the, the previous century and into this one. You know, 
we have, we've always had nations fight against nations over territory, over resources. Uh, but you see more and more today just random killing for killing's sake. Uh, terrorism. Uh, I was reading a story the other day about uh, an elderly couple in their 80s. They're at the cemetery and they were visiting their son who had died in the military. It was a military cemetery. And as they were there grieving over the loss of their son, uh, and he had been dead for a couple years, but every day this elderly couple would go to the seminary, seminary, uh, cemetery and uh, you know, just remember their son, a random man, came up behind them and shot both of them dead. What kind of world do we live in? And that's not isolated. You know, you've got people... 15, shooting, 15 shootings just this weekend in the city of St. Louis. No. Mass shootings, going into schools, going into movie theaters, uh, shooting from hotel rooms into uh, uh, plazas. And, I mean, you can just go down the list. That's where mankind is today. That's a God. That's a God. Um, they were, power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beast of the earth. It goes on in verse 9, and when he had opened, oh, well, we didn't read Matthew 24 and 8. And I, I don't want to, I think we'll forego going back to it, but do go back to Matthew 24, read through that, and you'll find that it very much complements what is given to us here. Um, but for time, we'll keep forward. Uh, verse 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and the brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So we see here the scene again uh, under the throne. Those that had been martyred had lost their lives for their testimony. Um, and they're asking, when is the judgment coming? Um, and, and we go on and he says that uh, the time is not yet. And white robes, representing the righteousness, not their righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that lamb that was slain, uh, it was said unto them that they should rest for a little cease until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So this is still a time where the word of God is being preached and people are being saved. Okay? That's what I see here. Now, I will try not to get into the rapture. It's all through you. And it's through other areas. Uh, and, you know, there are many different positions on the rapture. Uh, I will tell you this. It will not because, be because man is getting better. And that's what many espouse. It will be because uh, God is bringing his judgment on man and calling his servants out before he releases his wrath upon man. Uh, he... Uh, uh, in Matthew 24, 10 through 14, has some commentary on that. Verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her timely, untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, when you look at this, um, you'll see that all the way through here we see destruction that's brought about by Satan and his, um, his prophets, his followers, uh, death and destruction. Here we see that the earth, uh, in this sixth seal, there's a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Um, I, I was reading an article about Mount St. Helens just 
this past week. And it still has scientists confused. There is the Ring of Fire in the Pacific. And Mount St. Helens is offset. There is a range of volcanoes there, Mount Adams and some others. And then there's Mount St. Helens that's over here. And scientists have studied and researched and cannot figure it out. Why did Mount St. Helens blow? And, and when it blew, it blew the, the side out of the mountain. An orange mountain. Blew the side out. Uh, they don't understand it. Well, God does. God does. Uh, and that's the problem with man, is man tries to come up with answers for all things, but we can't. Uh, we would understand it better if we, understand, uh, if we followed and understood God's word. But here it talks about sun becoming black, a sackcloth of hair, and the moon becoming his blood. And that is um, um, reflective of earthquake and volcanic activity. When Mount St. Helens blew, then what you found was magma in the air as meteors, as stars falling. Um, you saw the earth become as black with sackcloth. It became cloudy around, the cloudy ash clouds around the earth. The moon became as blood. The stars of the heaven fell onto the earth, and, and I mentioned that magma, uh, that very well could be referring there to meteorite activity. I don't know. Uh, even as fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Uh, and we've seen historically, uh, just you know, through what's been passed on, uh, of the damage that meteorite activity striking the earth can do. Uh, many doomsday uh, movies have been made. That. Uh, Matthew 24, 29 to 31, again, is a reference for that supplemental information. Verse 15, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Who was not included in that? You could set bond and free and you had everybody included. But so that... Uh, we would understand it, it, this is worldwide. It is completely uh, encompassing. Verse 16, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of the wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Um, they're at the point where they just like to end their life. That's their request. But at the same time, what's verse 16 and 17 telling us? It's an acknowledgement of something, isn't it? And that would be... He says that they're hiding from the wrath of the Lamb. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are they saying? Uh, Under the mountains and the rocks fall on us. Hide us from the face of him who sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? <laughs> Does that sound like a reasonable reaction? I mean, what, in your mind, what would you do if you were in that same position? I think I'd kneel down. I think I'd repent from my sins. I think I would turn for salvation. But that's not the indication here. And I think this happens even today, where there are those that recognize that Jesus is uh, they recognize him as the Messiah, and yet, for various reasons, they reject and will not accept to their own doom. Uh, what time is it? 1026. Almost 1030. Okay, we're doing good. <laughs> Comments or questions? Thoughts? And <coughs> uh, we've got people here that can answer a lot of your questions that I can't? I'm sweating. <laughs> I think it is 92 degrees up here. All right, chapter 7. And this is this morning's lesson. <laughs> so, chapter 7, 
um, first introduces us to the 144,000 that are sealed. Now, if you go back to Daniel chapter 9, Daniel, Ch Daniel chapter 9 tells us that there are 70 years that are prophesied for whom? Israel. We want to keep that in the back of our mind as we're studying through all of this. This is about, it's, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, but part of that is we're coming to the close of the age that we're in now, which we refer to as the Gentile age, church age, and entering into the time when Israel sees, recognizes, and accepts Jesus Christ as their Messiah. There are those Jews today that have recognized and accepted and have been saved. There are Messianic Jews out there. Uh, but we, we will see a time, or there will be a time, we may not see, uh, but there will be a time when Israel will turn to God. There are many that want to dismiss Israel com uh, completely and claim that this is about the church or their religion. And they come up with all kinds of fantasies about it. But this is pretty specific. And I don't know how you deny it. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and take a look here. Uh, verse 1, chapter 7. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind would not blow on any earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. We'll stop there. What's he see? Four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. So they don't fall. What's it referring to? Yeah, it's not talking about the earth being square, but it's talking about all directions of the earth. And what were they doing? Holding back the wind. Holding back the wind. Now, uh, what does a lack of wind do? Back in those days, especially, it stopped all commerce. Because? Because, they, because the ships couldn't sail. There was no wind. Yeah, all they can do is row. Yeah, and that's a lot of rowing if you're taking something across the Mediterranean. Uh, what else? If it's hot, it makes it hot. <laughs> it, it makes it hotter if it's hot. Stop the windmills. Stop the windmills. Power generation. Mm -hmm. uh, water. I'm sorry? No water. No water. Why? Windmills. Okay, yeah. No water do the windmills. What else? Yeah, our, our whole ecological system is really structured so that you know the, the oceans, the water evaporates into the clouds and the clouds move across the land and then what happens? We were supposed to get rain. What happened when we had the uh, 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 eastern hurricanes? We got lots of rain. We got lots of rain. We are supposed to get lots of rain last night, I think, was supposed to have been some of that the night before and we are supposed to have some more this weekend. But what shifts all of that? What moves it? The wind. Yeah. When you have the wind stop, and I don't know how long it's going to be stopped here. I don't think it tells us. Um, but until they're all sealed. Until they're sealed. That, that's right. All right. Um, so for the earth and for mankind, those that are still living at this point, um, this is disaster. Uh, says, uh, wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Verse 2, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And then, wise, who these servants are that are sealed. Verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 140 
and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Very specific. Uh, each of these very tightly uh, reflect historically and theologically too the nation of Israel. Not any other group. Uh, not the church today, or the Lord's churches today, but specifically to Israel. Uh, and it says, the children of Israel here, to take this as anything else, and we'll talk a little bit more we'll, as we look at each of these, but to take it as anything else is to eliminate the literal application. And again, where we can uh, apply it literally, then we should. Uh, is it 144,000 exactly? Is it 12,000 from each tribe exactly? I have no reason to doubt it. Um, this uh, children of Israel, uh, one writer says this is referring specifically to sons or male <coughs> individuals. Um, in chapter, I believe it's 14, it also refers to um, Um, in verses 1 through 4, it speaks of them, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion with him, 144,000. I, I have to believe that these are the same ones, having his father's name written in their foreheads. You skip down, verse 4, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb, whether soever he goeth, and it goes on to describe. So, uh, so I believe that these are uh, male sons of Israel. And then he goes into the tribes. Now, he begins in verse 5, of the tribe of Judah. Now, why is Judah first? Who is the eldest of the sons of Jacob? Who is normally listed first? Reuben. But he's not here. Generally, in the listings, you find it begins with Reuben. Why would Judah be sealed? What's special about Judah? Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Their place in position, and that's my speculation, is that it's because of Jesus, uh, that they are named first. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Then of Reuben, of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Now, I want to pause. Who's Manasseh? And Joseph was who? Yeah, Joseph was one of the 12 sons. But here, Manasseh is inserted, and he's actually a grandson to Jacob. But he was one of two. Uh, Joseph received double portion in the inheritance. Here, Manasseh is inserted, sealed of 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. We'll pause again. What's Levi doing in here? In the inheritance that Jacob gave, what was Levi's inheritance? They were given the cities and the supported by the other tribes. That's right. There's a priestly tribe. They were among the people to... Um, uh, to execute uh, their office uh, as priests. And they were provided for by the other tribes. But here, unlike the other, the land grants, uh, they're included. Uh, Levi, 12,000. The tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph. So now we have, we already had Manasseh. Was he representing Joseph? Well, Joseph is listed there. So Manasseh's in there for some reason. Joseph is still showing. And of the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin was the youngest, were sealed 12,000. So how do we have 12? And yet we've got... Dan is not listed. Why isn't Dan listed? Not, we're not talking about Arthur. <laughs> well, I've heard that the name Dan means judgment. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's right. Is that the reason? I don't know. I don't know. I will tell you. Yes. Dan is not listed here. Manasseh is added in. And Levi is here also. So uh, you can you can investigate that for yourself. I don't know. Um, uh, just a reference. Romans 11, 25, 26, Jeremiah 30 and 10, Jeremiah 31, 33 tells us, and, and tying this back to it, that Israel will turn to accept Jesus as their Messiah. And I think that that is part of the result here, what we're seeing. Comments or questions before we move on? All right, verse 9. <clears throat> After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. How many were there? No man could number. That's a lot. Of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne of the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now, going back, this is also very specific. It's all encompassing. All nations, all kindreds, races, and people, and tongues, dialects, stood before the throne, as opposed to the 144,000 that's very specific. Five minutes. Five minutes, everybody. All right, keep me, keep me on. I don't want to, I don't want to cut in Brother Evans time. I know I don't. <laughs> all right. You uh, <laughs> uh, all right, so those that need to go get uh, some popcorn or refreshments. Um, stood before the throne and the Lamb. They're clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. What's that significant of? What's the white robe significant of? Period. Period. Of righteousness. And again, we, were, we go back, and that righteousness is not the righteousness of these but it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that washed their sins away. Um, palms in their hands. What are the palms of them get up? Worship. Uh, when Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem that final week before his death, what did the people throw down on the ground? Palms. Palms. Why? Palm Sunday. <laughs> exactly. They were celebrating Palm Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> That's what they did when somebody was a victor that came in. Yeah, they did it for victors. Now, that what they didn't understand was when Jesus came the first time, was he coming as? No. 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 They were looking for a king to come and to overthrow Rome and to bring about the rise of the Jews, the world dominance. Uh, but that wasn't the time. Here, they have palms in their hands significant of the king, of the victor. Verse 10, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, uh, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. So we have the Father sitting on the throne, and Jesus Christ, the Lamb, that they're shouting salvation. Uh, and it's salvation from God. It's his salvation given to man. Verse 11, and all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God. This is, and will catch the rest of it, but this is very similar to the scenes we've already had in chapter 4 and 5, where we have the description of the four beasts, the, the, the creatures around the throne, uh, those that were serving God, the angels that were there around the throne, uh, and here we see this multitude, and also in verse 11, angels, all the angels stood around the throne, now when we say all the angels, there's a third of the angels that will not be there. Why? They follow the voice. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> he goes on in verse 12 saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be under our God forever and ever. Amen. This is an acknowledgement. It's an acknowledgement that lost mankind has not made. It's an acknowledgement that oftentimes we ourselves are guilty of not allowing God. When you look at it, blessing, 
glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Do we always exhibit those things in the way we deal with God? No. Saved individuals. There will come a time when we will. And we certainly, in this life, the time that we have left, we should acknowledge him in all of these facets. Verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. I don't know if John knew or not. He says, Thou knowest. Uh, and he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and I'm told that that in the original is the great tribulation, which would refer to the that last week, uh, and you can divide that week up into three and a half, three and a half, and maybe even more so than, certainly there's days, seasons, and times that are, yeah, there's a lot there. Anyway, um, these are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are the saved. Um, out of the great tribulation. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. So here we see these individuals are before the throne, and they serve God day and night, and he sitteth on the throne, uh, and he that sitteth on the throne shall, shall indicating what? Time frame on. Yeah, future. If you want a hint as to what we will be doing, shall is in, uh, indicative of that. Shall dwell among them. He shall dwell among them. What will we be doing? I think just like these. Uh, we'll be serving him day and night. Not that there is day and night there. Night won't come. Jesus is the light and his light will shine uh, at all times. Uh, Verse 17, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Thoughts, comments? Right. Well, hopefully you get a chance to uh, uh, go through and study. There's a whole lot more than what we talked about there. Um, it's exciting. Uh, it's a little bit scary, but we don't need to be fearful of it because we know that God will watch over and protect us. Well, you know, listening to all this, it's, it's terrible. It, it's, it's horrible. It's horrifying. The 17 says, for the Lamb 